Luke chapter 19, verse 1, down through verse 10. Notice his word to us. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. And so he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And so he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to be, with, uh, to be a guest with a man who's a sinner. And then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And I'm talking today from the subject, Reflections. How do you see yourself? Reflections. How do you see yourself? Isn't it interesting that Jesus saw this man one way, but the crowd saw him another way? We struggle sometimes with the identity of who we really are, wondering, what do I look like to other folks? And it's amazing how we get our identity by the ethnicity into which we were born, where we went to school, uh, what team is your favorite team you'd be surprised where people find their identities what sorority or fraternity to which they belong but it takes a while of just reflecting to be able to get the real image of who you are in fact all of us today we couldn't have had any idea of what we looked like unless we saw ourselves through reflection you couldn't see yourself straight on so you had to see yourself by some means of reflection. Mankind is God's reflection. We're God's reflection. We're reflection of the living God. We are made in his image after his likeness because we are God's reflection. Isn't it amazing? Have you ever thought about the fact that earth is heaven's reflection? Earth is heaven's reflection. Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on as it is in heaven. It's supposed to be a reflection. It's a reflection place. It's a reflection. That's why the kingdoms of this earth shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ because this place is supposed to look like that place. That's why we begin to worship here because worship goes on there. And that's why he allows us to be able to look into the windows of heaven so we can see how we're supposed to do this thing down here. Does that make sense to you? This is a reflection place. Moonlight is a reflection of sunlight. It's a reflection. It's nothing but a reflection. Are you aware that the moon has no light of its own? It looks like it shines, but it only reflects light that comes from the, the sun. It is a reflection. The wife is a reflection of the husband. If you want to really know what a, what's about a, a man, look at his woman. There have been some people that I refused to hire because I saw the wife. If I really want to know how well a man is and what his character is like, I can tell that by looking at the wife's face. If I look in his mirror, I mean, if you all that in a bag of chips, but your wife's lip is swollen. She's a reflection. The wife is a reflection of the husband. The children are the reflection of the parent. Chip off the old block. 
You see some stuff in your children and you wonder, you, you praying for them, you know, like, Lord, 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 is this child ever going to get right? Let your mind run back to when you were that age and your mama was wondering. <laughs> reflections, reflections, reflections. It's just a reflection, just a reflection. Now, now, I'll be the first to admit to you that there are some reflections that are distorted. Have you ever looked in a mirror and you said, Lord, I know I can't be that big. <laughs> there, there are some reflections, you know, that are distorted. Now, so I, I will give you that. I, I will give you that. I will understand that. But how do you see yourself? Here was this man Zacchaeus. He, he, was, he was struggling with an identity issue. The name Zacchaeus means pure or justified. It means pure or justified, the name Zacchaeus. And so here he was. He was rich, but he wasn't pure. He was rich, but he wasn't justified. And, and somehow written into the, into the code of his name was the cry of his heart. He wanted to be pure. That's why he had an urging on the inside of him to see Jesus. So this is about a story of a man in hot pursuit to become pure or to become justified. He's in hot pursuit. Say hot pursuit. There's a certain thing that you have to be in hot pursuit of. Zac Zacchaeus knew that he, his life needed to change. And so he was under the impact of heat. May I say to you that whenever your life really needs to change, God's going to turn up the heat. Because heat produces change. Are you listening? Heat produces change. Heat produces change. Heat changes ice to water. Heat changes water to steam. Heat changes cold to hot. Heat changes impure to pure. Heat. The man Zacchaeus, his name means pure. You don't get pure unless you've been in the fire. Heat has an ability to change it. Most of us don't want to eat raw, so we want to put some heat to it so it'll change it. Because heat will produce a change in you. And you wonder sometimes why God lets you go in the fire? Because he's trying to get you done. Because heat produces change. Heat produces change. And so here is a man whose profession is that of a tax collector. And he's not just a tax collector, he's a chief tax collector. Maybe that's why he's rich. And he is despised among men because there was, it was obviously common practice for a tax collector. Tax collectors were synonymous with being sinners because they used intimidation to extort extra money out of people. This, this is, uh, you know, the IRS <laughs> of the day. And you know how we don't necessarily think so fondly of the IRS. And, and isn't it interesting how when you owe them money, they, they charge you penalty and interest. And when they owe you money, they don't send you penalty and interest. Sinners, sinners. I mean, they were, they were in, the, in the scriptures. I'm just, I'm just being biblical. Tax collectors. You don't really know how much of a sinner they are until it's tax time. And you owe. I have a total different opinion of them if I'm getting a refund. But when you owe, it's, it's, it's evil, wicked. <laughs> Wickedness, just wicked. And so here is this man, Zacchaeus. He became justified after receiving Christ. You, you, notice, notice his words in verse 8. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. I'm going to give it back. If, I, if I've ever done anything wrong, he said, I, I, I'll give it back four times. Four times. Now, now, he had to have some money to be able to do that. Now, you know how I many, I mean, if I take 20 from you and I'm going to give you $80? Oh, you know, you got to be saved for real. 
that lets me know that, that, that a work of purification and justification happened in Zacchaeus' heart. It's, it's clear evidence of a, of a divine work that God had done something in his heart. Because this, these words here in verse 8 are a classic sign of what's called fruits of repentance. Don't just let people repent and not have any fruit to prove that they have repented. Jesus talked about that. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 8, and the NIV says it this way, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In the, in the uh, New Living Translation, it, it says it this way, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. So this is fruits of repentance, and this man is saying, if I've wronged anybody, I'm going to make it right. This is restitution. You know, if you stole something, in the Old Testament, you were to add a fifth part to it. That was a 20% penalty for stealing. If you stole something, you had to add 20% onto it in the, as a part of the restitution. You didn't just say, I'm sorry. You added 20% penalty on it say as a fruit of your repentance concerning what you had done and then notice in verse 9 Jesus says to him today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham and it was identified by the fruit of repentance that had come in his heart but there was a struggle for Zacchaeus to become pure or justified he had to see Jesus he had to see Jesus so you cannot become a reflection of Jesus if you can't see Jesus. And we know that when we shall see him, that we shall be like him. Oh, my God, I wish somebody would sing, we shall behold him. My God, I'm, I'm just telling you, but when we shall see him, we shall be like him. You can't be like anything that you cannot see. And, and, and here... Zacchaeus now has two obstacles to overcome. He has two obstacles to overcome. Number one, the crowd. He's got to overcome the crowd. He's got to overcome the crowd. The very people who were around Christ were the ones obstructing the view of Christ. Isn't it something when religious people get in your way of being able to see Christ? I can't tell you how many folks that, who are offended with the church because they were around Christ and they obscured the view of other people who were desperate to see Christ and they couldn't see Christ because of a crowd. A crowd. Zacchaeus dealt with the physical restrictions imposed by the crowd. He also dealt with the psychological fear of the opinion of the crowd. He knew folks didn't like the tax man. And now he's dealing with the crowd. It, that, that was another impediment to his being able to see Christ because of the crowd. And he knew that in that crowd that there were stories that people had about the tax man. And here now Zacchaeus comes and, and he, realize, he realizes that there are various stories within the, in the crowd and, and that there are various opinions about him in the crowd. And then the physical limitations in terms of the proximity issue just because there were so many folks around him that he could not get to Jesus. But here's my point to you, don't let other people come between you and Jesus. If you ever let somebody come between you and Jesus, it means that they are closer to Jesus than you are. Don't let your mama come between you and Jesus, your daddy, your husband, your wife, your girlfriend, your boy <clears throat> boyfriend. Don't let anybody come between you and Jesus. Don't let anybody come between you and Jesus. Uh, because uh, we have these crowd things, trying to be just like everybody else, trying to follow the crowd. And I told you, whenever you follow the crowd, you get lost in the crowd. So you don't want to fool with a crowd and let a crowd keep you from being able to see Jesus. And let me just tell you this, Jesus is not always found in the crowd. You got to get into a place where the crowd is not because broad is the way that leads to destruction. And the Bible says, and many there be that go in there, thereat. But straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few that be that find it. So don't go following the crowd. Don't always go following the crowd looking for Jesus just because there's a crowd. It doesn't mean that the majority is right. We have an immoral majority now. And, and, and just remember that that distraction is really the destruction of your dream in slow motion. Distraction. It is the destruction of your dream in slow motion. 
He'll send somebody in the crowd just to distract you. Psst. Just to mess you up. And, and it's, it's a destruction of your dream in slow motion. So Zacchaeus dealt with the, the obstacle that he had to overcome of the crowd. The second thing that he had to deal with was his short stature. He dealt with his short stature. He couldn't change his stature, but he could change the, his position, which changed his perspective. May I just tell you this? Don't let the way that you were born become a problem to you. He couldn't help how, how tall he was. That, that, that was not something that, that he could help. But he did something about it. He couldn't change his height, but he could change his position. And when you change your position, you will change your perspective. And so here's my message to you. Change what you can. Change what you can. Change what you can. Learn to get over people and get over your own self-imposed limitations. You remember the thing that caused the 10 of the 12 Israelite spies not to enter the promised land? It was their inferiority complex of being as grasshoppers in their sight. They had an image problem in how they saw themselves. They saw themselves as grasshoppers. God saw them as well able to possess the land, but they saw themselves as grasshoppers. Helen Hemphill gave a very interesting quote that says, the lower your self-esteem, the more apt you are to believe that someone else holds the key to your happiness. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that an interesting thought? The image of how you see yourself, and we are wonderfully and marvelously made in the image of God. Theodore Isaac Rubin said this. He said, learn to love the fool in you, the one who feels too much, talks too much, takes too many chances, wins sometimes and loses often, lacks self-control, loves and hates, hurts and gets hurt, promises and breaks promises, laughs and cries. It alone protects you against the utterly self-controlled, masterful tyrant whom you also harbor and who would rob you of human aliveness, humility and dignity but for your food. And let me just say that there must be a balance between feelings of inadequacy and then thinking too highly of oneself. Now, I've met some people who have a very robust <laughs> self-esteem, who think that they are God's gift to the world, and, you know, they just... They're just way out there, you know, they just, you can tell when they walk in the room. They walk in your house and act like they own it. <laughs> and so the esteem is on one end for them and then you'll find another person who has the, these terrible feelings of inadequacy. Well, the Bible teaches in Romans chapter 12, verse 3 and then verse 16. Verse 3 says, I realize God has treated me with undeserved grace. And so I tell each of you not to think you are better than you really are. Use good sense and measure yourself by the amount of faith that God has given you. And verse 16 says, be friendly with everyone. Don't be proud and feel that you know more than others. Make friends with ordinary people. Did you know that scientists say that the less you know, the more you think you know? Touch a neighbor and say, I've, I've, I've met that person. <laughs> Scientists say that ignorant people tend to overestimate their intelligence. Isn't that interesting? But the wonderful thing is, is, is that if you don't like who you are, you have the ability to change. Do you want to change your life for the better? Here's where you start. You change your thoughts, change your thoughts, change your thoughts. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, so is she. Change your thoughts, change your feelings, change your feelings, change your feelings, change your actions. If you change your actions, you'll be surprised how your feelings will change. 
If you really want to change your life, change your friends. Because your life is about the sum of the five people who are closest to you. Change your friends. Change your environment. You want to start thinking on another level, you have to get in a different environment. It's hard to think new thoughts in the same old environment. Uh, if you really want to change your life, change your habits. You are collectively a, a, a sum of the, of the habits that, that are in your life. When you, when you change your thinking, your habits ought to change something that you do on a daily basis. Change your habits. And here's another thing. If you really want to change your life, change your hobbies. Change your hobbies. It's amazing. If you really want change in your life. But I, I'm glad that Zacchaeus was a leader. He wasn't just a tax collector. He was a chief. He's a chief. This man is a leader. He's a leader. A leader knows the way. A leader goes the way. A leader shows the way. There's a difference. This man is a leader. He's not designed by his nature to follow the crowd. That's why he wouldn't get in a crowd. He got above the crowd. Because Zacchaeus thought differently than the people who just followed. It's your thinking that will take you to different places. May I remind you that David killed Goliath, but not because of how he fought, but because of how he thought. And most people are trying to kill their giants in the skill of their fighting when it has to be in the skill of your thinking. He didn't kill Goliath because of how he fought. He killed him because of how he thought. Leaders think differently. I'm talking to leaders today. <laughs> leaders. And notice in verse 4, it's, it talks about how Zacchaeus ran ahead, ran ahead, ran ahead. He ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. He ran ahead. Listen, don't run without thinking. Don't run without thinking. We'll, we'll get an idea of something, run off, take off and start running. And then we fail. We, we get just a moment of inspiration, take off and try to start something before we have thought it through. Failure follows those who fail to follow through. Take your time. Think before you take off running. Think. Think about it before you run into business. Think about this thing before you run into a relationship. Think about this thing. Don't just say, oh, he cute. Oh, that, that's my, that head is. And bam. <laughs> Touch your neighbor and say, I know that person too. I know them. I know them. Notice verse 5, and when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. I must stay. Jesus started talking to him because he changed his position. Had he been in the crowd, he never would have seen him. But because he put himself in a different position, he got Jesus' attention. And a conversation ensued. And here's a principle that I want you to get. Conversation is the birthplace for change. Conversation is the birthplace for change. Nothing is going to change until you learn to talk about it. You got to start a conversation. You're not going to get a job until you get a conversation. Nothing will change until you get a conversation. Conversation is the birthplace for change. This man changed his position and now Jesus begins to converse with him. Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down, make haste, hurry up, come down because I must stay at your house. It was that conversation that changed his life. And, and, and I want you to notice what Zacchaeus did. Z Zacchaeus accelerated ahead of the crowd. He accelerated. A leader goes before others go. A leader sees before others sees. A leader sees ahead of the crowd. He sees ahead of the crowd. He sees ahead of the crowd. So notice that Zacchaeus went to that place. He accelerated his pace to get ahead of the crowd. He accelerated to get ahead of the crowd. Stephen Covey said this, effective leadership is putting first things first, but effective management is discipline carrying it out. What are you doing to accelerate your pace and to see before others see? Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Join us again next time for Power for Living, where